Or with this, it's the 1960s and California's new governor warring with the public university system goes to meet with the chancellors. Students mass to protest his arrival by standing shoulder to shoulder and staring at him in complete and jarring silence. He arrives, walks past, turns at the doorway, and puts his finger to his lips. Shh, he says, and winks. <laughs> they start to laugh. Or the time he was heckled at a rally in 1984 and said, you know, I just may let Mr. Mondale raise his own taxes. <laughs> Ronald Reagan could dance. Well, Peggy Noonan put it very well, as she is wont to do. Certainly the theme of this evening is Roosevelt and Reagan, masters of the dance. That brilliant simplifier, Theodore Roosevelt, divided presidents into two categories, Lincoln presidents and Buchanan presidents. Modern political scientists use different words to say much the same thing. When they speak of active versus passive, leader versus manager, bold visionary versus defender of the status quo, either or. Not surprisingly, for much of the last century, so-called strong presidents have been celebrated for their willingness to enlist the state in economic planning and the pursuit of equal rights under the law. Beginning with Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, it has become accepted wisdom that the greatest of our presidents strengthen the office even as they centralize authority in Washington, D.C. No one more dramatically advanced this view of the modern presidency than the first modern president. Before FDR, there was TR, as entertaining as he was emphatic, and a godsend to political cartoonists. When he died, there's a wonderful story his sister, uh, Corinne Robinson, was stopped on the streets of New York by an Irish policeman who said, oh, Mrs. Robinson, it wasn't just that he was a great leader, but do you remember the fun of him? <laughs> just remember the fun of him. Beginning with Theodore Rex, the modern White House became a temple in the cult of presidential personality. Today it stands ringed with satellite dishes ready to beam every presidential utterance to a public for whom 24-hour news cycles and saturation coverage poses an ironic threat to any leader who presumes to dominate his age and set the national agenda. After all, how many television characters last more than a single season, let alone four or eight years? Yet that is exactly what presidents have become, guests in our electronic home and just as likely to wear out their welcome as most company. History, like lightning, is not supposed to repeat itself. A dozen years after the old rough rider went to his grave, his distant cousin would replace another president, Herbert Hoover, whose shortcomings were publicly and poignantly summed up in his own lament that you can't make a Teddy Roosevelt out of me. Franklin Roosevelt entertained no such doubts. I want to be a preacher president, he said, in conscious emulation of his swashbuckling cousin. By the 1930s, the Bowie pulpit first put to such effective use by the first Roosevelt was electronically wired. Thanks to radio, millions of Americans, and I suspect some of you in this hall tonight know exactly what I'm talking about, could listen to a president in their own homes. Aiding FDR's honey on toast baritone was a keen sense of timing and an instinctive grasp of the dangers of overexposure. A depression-weary public responded overwhelmingly to the new messenger and his message of hope. The actress Lillian Gish said of FDR, he seemed to have been dipped in phosphorus. Herbert Hoover's mail had been taken care of by a single clerk. Franklin Roosevelt had to hire 50 clerks to take care of his mail. As the presidency reached new heights of prestige and visibility, the rest of the federal government grew in direct proportion to the economic and foreign crises of the period. Contrary to popular belief, in 12 years, Roosevelt conducted just 30 of his celebrated fireside chats. Shying away from overtly partisan appeals, he used homely metaphors to ingratiate himself with listeners around America's kitchen tables. So he spoke of priming the pump to justify deficit spending, and of loaning embattled Britain a garden hose in the form of Lend-Lease, with which to douse the flames started by Hitler 
and his Nazi arsonists. Among the listeners who drew hope from the buoyant new occupant of the White House was a shoe salesman's son in Dixon, Illinois. Ronald Reagan was a child of the Great Depression, which crippled the American economy in the 1930s, casting doubt on the future of the country's democratic institutions. In the Reagan household, Franklin D. Roosevelt was an icon of hope, as were his New Deal programs, not least of all for Ron's alcoholic father, Jack, who landed a job with the WPA. Young Reagan cast his first presidential ballot for FDR. In fact, he would vote four times for Franklin Roosevelt. At the time, he could scarcely imagine that one day he would lead his own political counter-revolution, a conservative crusade to reverse the flow of power to Washington, first implemented by his boyhood hero. Now, on the surface, there seems little to bond the aristocratic Roosevelts of Hyde Park with the itinerant Reagans of Dixon, Illinois. There are, however, many kinds of roots. The Reagan family may have been poor enough that oatmeal meat was considered a delicacy, but Nellie Reagan, the Bible-quoting mother who assured Ron that everything in life was part of God's plan, gave her son as firm a grounding in his own place in the moral universe as did Sarah Delano to her beloved only child on their Hudson Valley estate. Growing up in a household dominated by adults, young Franklin Roosevelt learned early to hide his true feelings behind a dutiful facade of smiling aloofness. As president, he would have countless acquaintances and almost no true friends. Much the same could be said of Ronald Reagan, the bookish youth who lived in his dreams and through his mother's fundamentalist faith. I will actually, I still remember a day back in 2000, we did a program in this room uh, called When Politics Was Still Fun. And one of the folks we had that day was Lynn Novziger, the late Lynn Novziger, who served uh, memorably as, as Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, press spokesman, I remember at the time of the uh, assassination attempt in March of 1981. And I'll never forget, Lynn told me something that opened my eyes in some ways about Reagan, uh, who was much more observant than he is generally thought to have been. You know what Reagan's boyhood ambition was to be? He wanted to be a cartoonist. We all heard about him doodling away in dull cabinet meetings, which is probably about the most intelligent thing you can do if you're trapped in a dull cabinet meeting. Um, but stop and think what a, what a cartoonist is, an artist um, whose livelihood depends upon his powers of observation, who's someone who steps back and watches everything and everyone around him. From his first day in office, Franklin Roosevelt experimented with new ideas. Consistency would never be his hobgoblin. At the same time, he wasn't afraid to make mistakes. I have no expectation of making a hit every time I come to bat, he explained to one aide. What I seek is the highest possible batting average. In 1934, FDR dismayed reformers by naming the financier Joseph P. Kennedy to be chairman of the new Securities and Exchange Commission. Even Jim Farley, the uh, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, protested the appointment, reminding Roosevelt of the unscrupulous methods that Kennedy had employed in building his fortune. FDR was unfazed, unpersuaded. He had his own rationale for putting Kennedy in charge of Wall Street. In his words, set a thief to catch a thief. <laughs> A man of instincts rather than fixed ideology, Roosevelt seemed surprised when someone asked him to outline his personal philosophy. Why, he said, I am a Christian and a Democrat. He was similarly unreflective when his own wife raised the issue of religious training for their children. I never really thought about it, he told her. I think it is just as well not to think about things like that too much. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was scarcely more introspective, and yet, for someone who was so wedded to basic truths, Reagan's midwife decision to jettison his lifelong commitment to the purity of Roosevelt represented a spiritual and intellectual crisis that was hardly less wrenching than FDR's bout with polio. In time, both men would be shot at by would-be assassins, their graceful responses exposing the steel behind their smiling exteriors. <laughs> 